Our second keynote speaker today comes from the Central European University in Vienna, where he is the director of the PhD program in network science. Uh, Martin Gansai has made a number of important contributions in the study of complex networks, in particular, both in spatial and time-dependent network. His present interest uh, is in the field of computational human dynamics with the developments of data-driven models of social phenomena, including contagion processes. Um, also, uh, Martin was the uh, chair of the last conference on complex systems last year in, uh, in Lyon. So it is a pleasure to have him here today as a keynote speaker, and he will talk on the on socioeconomic networks, segregation patterns, and their dynamics. Martin. Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, this is a great honor to be here today. All right, and now the right slides. Uh, thank you for the uh, organizers to, to bring me here as a keynote speaker. Um, my talk today is going to be about um, a series of recent works focusing on socioeconomic networks, segregation patterns, and how they change, if they change at all, as a function of time. The main focus of my talk is about socioeconomic inequalities, which is um, um, a personal uh, character, actually the socioeconomic status itself, and it is unevenly distributed in every modern societies, uh, indicating actually the social and economic positions of people, the uneven distribution of this position. Um, it is um, arguably correlated with the people's education, occupancy, mobility, or social relationships, and can lead actually to global phenomena like, for example, segregation in housing, uh, education, or even limited social mobility, poverty, or immigration. Um, this is a very important issue. On the other hand, it's very difficult to observe it. And um, why is it important to observe? Because uh, socioeconomic inequalities, techniques to observe socioeconomic inequalities can actually contribute to, for example, census, uh, which is very expensive at the same time. The other um, aspects of my talk is relying on a social mechanism, which is also on the individual level. This is what's called um, status. Uh, homophily, and indicating an increased probability of people to interact if they belong to the same socioeconomic group or they actually share similar social status. Um, just an example here, you can see the late queen, but also all the queens and kings around the world on the same picture, indicating a very, um, um, uh, very good image actually about um, status homophily itself. So my hypothesis is that Socioeconomic inequalities together with status homophily uh, may actually introduce some correlations in social networks. My question is that whether these two mechanisms, the, the distribution of socioeconomic um, uh, characters and status homophily can induce stratification or can induce um, segregation in social networks, whether they are biasing mixing, social mixing, or actual mobility mixing of people, I wonder whether these patterns, what we can or we cannot observe in a network, may change as a function of time on the long run or on the short run. In order to answer this question, I'm going to walk you through uh, several studies, which are actually relying on large data sets. So what kind of data we need to study socioeconomic networks? First of all, we need individual socioeconomic status or indicators of socioeconomic status of indi on the individual level. We need a network structure, which is connecting these individuals. And um, if we would like to study mobility mixing, indeed, we need some mobility uh, data as well. And um, preferably, we need this all about millions of individuals. Um, the studies I'm going to talk about are focusing on three different aspects of this challenge. The first set of studies will, uh, will uh, work on actually the inference of socioeconomic status of people, which is um, a computational challenge. The second part is relying on a data combination 
uh, to actually obtain the second lake networks, and we will look for static segregation patterns in these structures. Finally, I will study how we are going, how these segregation patterns are changing as a function of time uh, due to external shocks. In order to start, let's introduce, let me to introduce a few inventive ways we came up over the last couple of years to infer individual socioeconomic status from various data sources. The first data I'm going to use is a large Twitter corpus which was collected in France. And more precisely, I'm going to focus on um, geolocated tweets only of about 127,000 people have, who have about 1 million geolocated tweets. And after certain filtering of these tweets, um, we could reconstruct the trajectory of this, these people, what we could use actually to identify, to infer their home locations. In the end, from the 127,000, we had about 32,000 people with an inferred home location, which is actually the location where they spend most of their time during the night. At the same time, if we have a socioeconomic map, and in case France, this is openly accessible, shared by the Statistical Institute of the country, um, this map is a uh, very high resolution, actually puts a 200 times 200 meters grid on the whole territory of France. And for each of these bins, sharing the average income of people living over there, or for example, the percentage of real estate owners at that given location. So now that we have this 32,000 people's home location, we can just simply pin them on this map and we can actually assign to each individual an average income as a socioeconomic variable. So this is rather easy uh, once the home location in France is known. On the other hand, what happens if you don't have a, a location of people? For this case, we worked out another toy model where we used, again, the same Twitter data set and we looked for users who were sharing their LinkedIn profile on Twitter. And we went actually on LinkedIn and we crawled their profile information. We succeeded to get about 4,000 people. Um, for these people, we knew actually their job description and also their skill set, but we could use to train a model. And this model was actually associating between skill sets and occupation of people. On the right hand side, you can see what our model identified as the top 30 most relevant skill for a program developer, for example. After this, we can again go back on the website of the Statistical Institute, which is sharing an occupation income table. And yet again, we arrived at the same result that we had uh, individuals with assigned socioeconomic indicator as income. What if, on the other hand, we have location of people, but we don't have a socioeconomic map? In that case, one can play another game, relying on remotely sensed satellite images, that at certain home locations, one can get actually from Google Maps, uh, the satellite image and also the street view image around a certain location, and choose only those locations which are corresponding to residential areas. And um, well, I had two friends, two architects, one architect and one urban designer, who were actually uh, happy to hand label 1,000 locations like this, telling us from the urban structure and the environmental characters, whether the certain location is belonging to a low or to high socioeconomic class. And indeed, they came up um, with the labeling, which was consistently correlated uh, with the results of the other methods. Now, the question is, we have these three different methods. They are rather simple. Which one is the best? It turned out that actually the occupation-based LinkedIn data was the best, which was providing us the most precise socioeconomic indicators. The second one was based on the remote sensing um, uh, technique, while the people uh, on the census, while the architects were the performing the worst, but yet way better than, uh, than random. So now this is cool. On the other hand, they are um, not really scalable. These solutions cannot apply it cannot be applied on millions of people. So we have to come up with something more robust, which is uh, applicable for complete cities or even for a complete country. There are many studies which are using uh, remotely sensed satellite images and deep learning models to train uh, large machine learning models to solve this issue. And we are going to do something similar. On the other hand, there is another problem with this approach, namely that these machine learning models, they usually work as black boxes. They don't actually tell us how they make decisions. So our next challenge is not only to infer certain status of locations, but also to somehow figure out how the model is telling us that this is a poor or this is a rich location. We are going to use three different data sets for this um, problem. One is a very high resolution 
satellite imagery, which is openly available for 290 European capitals or European and municipal areas with 20 centimeter resolution. Uh, the second data set is the already mentioned um, socioeconomic map, which is coming from the French Statistical Institute with a resolution of 200 meters. And finally, for the second part of the study, we will use an urban atlas, which is putting um, sets of polygons on uh, uh, most of the European um, municipal areas and assigning to each of these polygons a label from 17 urban and 10 rural uh, area classes, indicating the function of that given location of that given polygon in, within the city. We are going to focus on five French cities first and trying to answer the question, can we first, can we act automatically infer the socioeconomic status of inhabitants of people living at a certain location from the satellite images only? Well, the short answer is yes, we can. Um, even with a very high precision here, you see the confusion matrix between the predicted and the observed um, socioeconomic status values um, in, in Paris. It comes with an accuracy of 0 0.85. And um, this is actually a signing that this technique, technique is very powerful if we would like to solve this problem. We are not the first one, probably we are not the last one who were using satellite images for this uh, challenge. Here I list a few other teams who were um, doing this, sometimes even better than us. You can also evaluate our performance visually. Here I show you the original and the predicted socioeconomic maps of Paris and the four other uh, cities in France. Here you can see a um, um, relatively good match between uh, the original map and actually the socioeconomic labels we predicted at each location. On the other hand, we have the second question we, I haven't answered yet, namely that um, can we, how can we understand um, how this type of model is making decision about a certain location to observe it as a, or predict it as a rich or a poor. To solve this problem, we are going to medical imaging and we are borrowing a method from there called the guided breath cam method, which is allowing um, actually to map back the activation, pixel activation um, of, a, of a trained machine learning model back on the original picture and help us actually to identify which are those pixels which were activated when the model was predicting the location to be poor or rich. Combining these activations, uh, pixel activations with the, with the urban polygon data set, we could actually identify those polygons, consequently those urban functions, which were most correlated with locations predicted uh, for the different socioeconomic classes. This is cool, and actually we can um, uh, visualize this and look what are those characteristic urban functions which are um, at the poor or rich locations as it is predicted by the model and we can come to conclusions like I'm trying to which one on top of the, sorry. Um, I don't speak Spanish but it's just because they cannot see I yes see the title yes. All right, I can tell you the title for each slide, okay? So this is about interpretability of machine learning models to predict socioeconomic status. So we can actually identify uh, patterns like um, richer local people who richer people actually live closer to nature or green areas, or poorer people live closer to highways or um, uh, industrial areas. And what is also important and interesting that these patterns change from city to city, for example, living close to the sea, means something very different in Nice or in Marseille. Um, if you're interested in this um, result, you can just go to our paper listed below there. All right. Now we know something about hmm, how the model, the, the, the machine learning model is actually um, predicting our um, different socioeconomic classes. On the other hand, we are relying on a single data source, which is satellite images. This is actually making our model less robust and it is also exposed to certain data biases. So we can come up with a better model, which is in terms of computation very heavy. So I don't advise you to do it on your own computer. It will be on fire very soon. Um, but relying not only on a single data source, but relying on several other data sources collected at the same location. 
Indeed, there are many other open data sources, like, for example, uh, night light intensity, which is a kind of a satellite image as well, telling us, for example, the electricity used at a certain location, or the number of um, cell towers, mobile cell towers in the area, or the local infrastructure can be actually obtained from the OpenStreetMap. But we can also incorporate behavioral data coming from uh, different APIs of uh, the Facebook realm. Uh, for example, marketing API could tell us about local demographic statistics uh, of the population living at a certain area, or we could use high resolution population maps or the number of people moving in and out at a certain location. Yet we need a ground truth data and um, in the countries we are going to focus on, um, we are using the DHS uh, program survey, which is which was collected at certain locations in households and giving us at a given location, a vast index as a socioeconomic indicator. All right, so to solve the problem, it is very simple. It is a supervised learning problem. We focus on a single country of Uganda, and uh, we have these locations where the DHS surveys have been collected. We train our model at these locations using all the data layers at the same time, and then look where people live in the country elsewhere. So what are the populated places? And we use our model to predict socioeconomic status at these uh, other populated locations. The model that we designed to do this exercise is rather complicated. It consists of two parts. One, the first part is a convolutional neural network, uh, which is only taking as input the ground truth data and the satellite images. But instead of um, predicting um, the socioeconomic status directly, we take the second last layer of this model and we feed it to a regression model, an XGBoost model, which is combining all our other data sets at the same time to make our final prediction, which is the mean and the standard deviation of the international wealth score. So if we do this for Uganda, we can obtain a high resolution socioeconomic map for the whole country um, at the populated places, as you can see, which is very sensitive to um, local variants of socioeconomic status and can also tell us a lot about urban and uh, uh, rural divine in the given country. Um, the precision of our model was an ARSC 0.81, which is very close to the state of the art um, right now. All right, now we know the socioeconomic status, or we have some information about the socioeconomic status of people living at a certain location, yet I didn't talk at all about networks so far. In order to have socioeconomic networks, we have to have some interaction information about these people living at these locations. And uh, the best data source what one can use for this kind of research is, of course, the mobile phone call data. Um, what we are using here is a data coming from Sierra Leone, who were covering about 1.3 million people, uh, provided by the second largest uh, mobile phone phone company in the country. And what this data gives us is the actions of communication, so who called who, is completely anonymized, of course, and or, or who sent an SMS to, to, to someone else. But we also know the location of um, the company users at the moment of their communication. Sorry. So using this data set, indeed, we can infer again, the home location of these people, but yet on the resolution of um, the mobile cell towers. And as you can see, the mobile cell tower coverage of Uganda is very low resolution. So um, this is actually the most precise location what we can have about people around the country. On the other hand, we have now a very high resolution socioeconomic map. So we had to come up with a very simple weighted averaging method, which was combining uh, at the certain mobile cell, talk, uh, cell tower location, the socioeconomic indicators, the population density to come up with a single indicator for each location for the res uh, representative area corresponding to the given tower. So now we have, again, the socioeconomic map build up for Uganda combined with the mobile data set. And we can use two definitions of networks. One can come from the social network, uh, social communication network where nodes will be people. Uh, the socioeconomic indicator comes from the cell, in cell tower uh, relative wealth index. Links are going to be between these people if they call or SMS each other, and the weight of these links are going to be uh, the number of communications between them. We can play a 
another, uh, we can do another network definition, which is about mobility networks. Uh, here, actually, nodes are going to be locations, and the links are between home locations and visited places for each individual. Um, the weights of these links will be actually the number of low visits which happen between two certain locations in the country. So now you can see that we obtain two attributed networks, uh, which where each node have uh, a socioeconomic indicator assigned, and we could follow how people mix socially, how people how people with, uh, mix physically in the country. It, I would like to stress that this is the same population of people, and we are looking for two different behavioral traits at the same time. So if you simply draw this map, this network on the map, this is actually the social, uh, socio uh, the mobile mobility socioeconomic network, you can see certain patterns and what we expect from this uh, network, from our hypothesis taking uh, status homophily as an important mechanism, that people are supposed to actually visit locations which are close to their own socioeconomic class, not in space, but in terms of the socioeconomic indicator, um, while they're supposed to visit less frequently places which are from far or remote classes. And indeed, if we visualize this network as an assortativity matrix, this is what we get. Here we can see that this matrix appears with a very strong diagonal, showing exactly what I just said, that people tend to visit to other places of their own or very similar socioeconomic class. That means to stress that we remove from this calculation visits to people's own home tracts. So this is actually visits some, somewhere else all the time. We can do the same game for the social communication network and we find something very similar, indicating that people not only move to places of their own socioeconomic class, but people interact with others so, uh, through the communication system who belong to the same or similar socioeconomic class in the country. All right, so we have this very nice uh, assortativity matrices. How can we uh, quantify them? We could use very simply the Newman assortativity index, uh, which is going to be our network segregation index, simply measuring the correlation between the socioeconomic status of connected people or connected places in the country. And as you can see, the this uh, segregation index for the mobility network and also for the social network are very, very high, around 0 0.66 or 0 0.51. So these are the static patterns, socioeconomic uh, static, statification or socioeconomic segregation patterns, what we could find in a, in a country of Sierra Leone, but yet this is just a single country. How can we be sure that this is true anywhere else? Um, in another study, we did the same exercise, but on the 50 largest American uh, metropolitan areas. And we found very similar patterns in terms of um, social and mobility uh, segregation. More importantly, we even found a correlation indicating that if in a certain area, there is a larger community assortativity or mobility assortativity, there will be a larger social network assortativity at the same time. If you're interested in this line of research, the other papers, please have a look. Finally, I would like to address um, the main question, in my opinion, how these patterns are changing as a function of time. One would assume that segregation is something rigid. It is very expensive to change because this change is actually requiring uh, policy, new policy or new educational strategy or the build of a new transportation line or a new housing strategy in a certain city. And uh, Although these kind of measures would induce social mobility in the given country, yet they are very expensive. Consequently, they happen in a very, very slow pace. On the other hand, what if there is an emergency, an external shock, for example, a war or a natural disaster, or for example, the COVID-19 pandemic, whether these kind of shocks lead to the reorganization of socioeconomic networks and the change of the otherwise very rigid socioeconomic segregation patterns as a function of time. To answer this question, we go back to our mobile call data set, which was actually recorded over four weeks, exactly for this purpose. Um, it was two weeks before the first national, national lockdown in Sierra Leone, um, during the national lockdown and the week after, which was the beginning of a curfew period. Um, just to have a first look, we plot the activity uh, 
of um, an activity measure of mobility, which is the average trip distance, how people, how far people travel in different socioeconomic classes. And what we find first is that indeed the richest people were traveling the shortest distance and they had a otherwise expected weekly pattern indicating that they travel less during the weekends and more during the weekdays. But what is interesting that the poorest class uh, didn't have at all this weekly pattern and they were the one traveling the largest distance up to 40 kilometers per day. During the lockdown period, actually the richest class was the one who could adjust the best, decreasing their travel distance almost to zero, while the poorest class also adjusted, yet their decrease was maximum to 20 kilometers per day. If you look at the mobility, uh, the mobile phone call communication activities, we, we can see an opposite but very similar picture. There, the largest activity corresponds to the richest people and they had the largest decrease in terms of communication activity, while the poorest people didn't have, um, in this case, either a weekly pattern and the decrease was relatively small as compared to the top class. So it means that in terms of mobility and also in terms of communication, we had a very different adjustment capacity uh, for people from different socioeconomic classes. Yet I didn't say anything about segregation um, uh, um, until now, but we can simply measure this assertivity index as a function of time as well for every day during our observation period. In case of mobility, what we find is something expected because during the lockdown, people were actually um, requested to stay at home and don't travel, which was in inducing an increase of socioeconomic segregation in the mobility network, as you can see by the maximum <coughs> of the assertivity curve here, <coughs> and also the, the more focused uh, assertivity matrix on the top. On the other hand, if you turn to the, mobility, uh, the social communication network, we see an opposite effect. Surprisingly, the socioeconomic segregation in the social network was decreasing during the lockdown. It means that during the lockdown period, people reached out and mixed socially using their phone more than they did during the reference periods. You can see this as the minimum of the segregation curve and also as a more dispersed uh, uh, connectivity or assertivity matrix corresponding to this period. So the question, why? This is a, at least for me, it was a very counterintuitive result. So we try to go to the depths, <clears throat> in depth to the bottom of this problem. And uh, <clears throat> we realized that uh, there is one very important characteristics of the country, namely that uh, Sierra Leone is divided into a, a Western area, which is actually the capital district containing the top socioeconomic classes in the country and to the out of Western area, which is the rest of the country where people are living in poverty or reaching maximum and middle, lower middle class. So once we divide the country to these, let's say urban and rural areas, uh, we can check how the, the travel uh, activities changed as a function of time between or within these areas. And what we can see in terms of mobility is that during lockdown, the, because of the interventions, the um, largest decrease was happened in mobility between the Western and out of Western areas, actually leaving uh, poor and rich areas to be stronger segregated during this period because people were simply not traveling from the richest part of the country to the poorest part of the country. On the other hand, if you look at the, the social communication activities, we see the opposite. Actually, the largest reduction in terms of uh, communication activities happened inside the Western area. So richest people stopped actually to call. Um, and relatively the most dominant uh, um, activities became the communication between the Western and out of Western area. Also note that uh, all these activities could be due to the um, the stop of professional communication during the lockdown. We checked this, we removed communications and mobility during office hours and actually we obtained the same picture. Very nice, so we now kind of understand why uh, we have uh, segregation increase in terms of mobility and segregation decrease in terms of um, social communication, yet we have everything only at the network level. What if we could measure the, the assertivity, the segregation index on the individual level? And this is indeed possible by a measure which was 
defined by Lito, Peel, and others recently, uh, what they call the individual assertivity index, which is um, an individual measure looking at the egocentric network and the vicinity of each node and look for um, um, heterogeneity in terms of certain attribute, in this case, socioeconomic status. And if we compute this individual assertive index, assertivity index for each people, for the poorest class first, and we compute the distribution of them, we indeed see that as compared to the reference period, which is the thin pink line, our distribution is strongly shifted to the right, meaning people's assert mobility assertivity increased significantly during the lockdown. And this is indeed true also for the richest class. On the right-hand side, I show you the differences between the first reference period and the subsequent periods of our observation. And indeed, these large um, bars over here shows that the largest uh, segregation increase was for the poorest class during the lockdown period. And actually this segregation was smaller uh, for richer classes um, in the population. If you do the same game for um, social communication, we see something, um, uh, something different. First of all, for the poorest class, we see clearly that the lockdown was decreasing the socioeconomic segregation of this uh, population because actually the corresponding distribution was shifting for smaller yeah. values. On the other hand, richer classes, uh, segregation increased just as their mobility. They didn't call uh, as they were calling before. They actually got stuck inside on socioeconomic class. And this is what you could see over here in the difference plot showing that the poorest uh, classes had uh, considerable segregation decrease, while the richest people had a segregation increase. Overall, because of the dominant population was falling, uh, appearing with a decrease of segregation, the overall segregation decreased, as we have seen to the overall assertivity measure. Um, yet I would like to generalize this observation for other countries. So we had another uh, study where we looked for mobility segregation change during intervention periods in uh, four different cities. Uh, Bogota, Jakarta, London, and New York. Here I'm showing the, uh, the results for London on the left-hand side, where you could see the assertivity matrices and the corresponding segregation indices uh, for the different periods and their differences. And as you could see, if you compare the, the before lockdown and the first lockdown period in London, there was a huge increase in terms of mobility segregation, which after it relaxed somewhat. But if you compare to the before lockdown and the Re, uh, reopening period uh, to each other, you could see that there is a residual segregation pattern uh, in the city. And this is consistent for all the other cities except New York, um, that during the first lockdown, there was a significant increase of segregation, which after they relaxed even um, during later lockdowns, but never got back to the original segregation level. All in all, all these studies were um, bringing me that I want that you remember three different messages. Uh, one is that socioeconomic inequalities are important and they actually effectively uh, induce co correlation patterns um, in social and mobility networks. And on the other hand, their observation is rather difficult. Uh, it requires huge um, computational resources. Uh, but at the same time, if you use, if one use multiple data sources, one can actually obtain this kind of networks. And finally, that although they appear to be very rigid um, in peacetime, due to external shocks like the pandemic, for example, they could change abruptly in a very, very short term. Um, of course, all this work was not done by me, but I am very grateful for my research team. They are here on the slide and also all of them are here in the audience. So if you have any question, don't hesitate to talk to us. And also for my other collaborators, there are many of them and our funding sources, and in the end, if you are interested in our results, please have a look at one of our papers listed on the right-hand side. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Martin. We have uh, time for questions now. Let's again start uh, from the audience. We have a number of people online. Maybe I missed it, but 
And what happened after the ep epidemic? So you said uh, it, could, it could change. Okay, so I was just wondering, you said a, a shock can change these, these patterns, but after the shock, what is happening then? Yes, so we tried, we had the same question, and as I was showing, in terms of mobility, there is certain residual segregation, which remains, so the, the system will not relax back to its pre-pandemic or pre-shock phase. On the other hand, in terms of social communication, we found that um, probably due to the everyday communication is um, less restricted, than mobility patterns, they are actually, people actually just start calling after the, the lockdown period, just as they were doing before. We could not study this further because the data set ended, but one could actually look for longer periods and then see, is there any, any special residual effects of this? Yeah. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. It's really interesting. Uh, I was wondering, uh, in terms of deep learning and inferring the socioeconomic networks and, and your mobility networks, um, I think you alluded to it a little bit with your architect friend. Um, but how do you, how would you uh, incorporate? Say you have um, sociologists or economists. How would you incorporate that expert knowledge? Say you know because. I think you could probably, it's kind of commonsensical, let's say that you live next to a highway, you probably are um, in the in the poorer classes, or if you lived with an industrial zone that typically is also, you know, fairly poor. So um, with the architect friend, it seems like it was only a, a classification of building types rather than directly towards, well, these are poor, these are not. So um, do you have methods in order to incorporate these extra knowledges, maybe by a Bayesian method or, anything like that um it's a very very good question my answer is no i don't <laughs> uh so the first part of the talk was mostly about how to generate ground truth data for training and uh, this is i mean when i talked about architects it was not involving at all uh, a training at that phase with the architects we were just using the labels they were giving us to train a model okay but what you are saying is that whether this expert knowledge can be incorporated into the model itself. Uh, probably yes, we haven't done it yet, but it's, I think, a very good thing to think about. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Uh, basically, I have a couple of questions concerning one particular small thing. Uh, you mentioned several times this uh, greed covering the territory of France with a resolution 200 meters by 200 meters, which sort of, for which you have some uh, socioeconomic metrics. Uh, basically, if you look at the France as a whole, there is on average five people living in a, squ in, in, in a, in a uh, square that size. Number one, surely there are lots of empty spaces. Number two, even if you look at, say, suburbs of a big city, it's probably like 20 people. So, so you surely should have some sort of privacy, privacy issues when you associate uh, Twitter users to, 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 to such a granular places, how it is resolved. And maybe it, is, it makes more sense to, to, to separate the territory not by square meters, but by the number of people living in each. Uh, in each bit, actually. Um, thank you. This is a very important question, indeed. Um, um, there are two data sets which is shared uh, by INSEE. One, which is this 200 times 200 meters grid, which is a data set which is in Windsorized, which means that if there was a bin where there were not enough people living, I think the threshold was 10, um, they were actually moving, modifying the indicators not to be able to re-identify people's real wealth or socioeconomic indicators. Uh, and all the other, actually all the indicators were given per capita. So in that sense, it was not uh, uh, scaling uh, the, um, with the number of people living at a certain location. The other data set that we also use heavily 
uh, is a little different. There, actually, the population is fixed. So 2,000 people were in every bin, and the size of the bin was changing. So in, uh, in urban areas, the bin size is very, very small because it's a very densely populated area. And to the rural area, what we didn't really care about because we were focusing on cities, these bins grow very large. And this is obviously answering your question on, on, um, on um, privacy issues uh, from the data. But I encourage you to study both of these data. There is an update from 2019, which is really cool. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you, Martin, for this really interesting talk. Um, you showed that during the lockdown periods, mobili uh, mobility decreased, which is, I guess, to be expected and the goal, but also that social connections through calling or something decreased, which to me was quite unexpected. And I was wondering if you have some kind of uh, process-based explanation for that. Yes, especially after removing um, professional communication, we still saw the decrease of communication. Uh, which is very surprising. What we were trying to understand that how this um, decreased amount of communication first distributed between different socioeconomic class and, and honestly, actually the increase of uh, the socioeconomic or the decrease of segregation was because the rich people stopped calling. And actually the underlying patterns of uh, poorer people became more dominant. So this is the, this is why we see what we are seeing and why people who are who people are calling actually differently during the lockdown. It's a very, very good question. Um, probably people, their family who lives on the countryside. That's my first um, um, assumption. The other, trying to reach out to people who they can seek like, like uh, valuable information about the situation. That's my other uh, explanation why people actually change their calling patterns during this period. But why the overall decrease happened in terms of uh, communications, even after removal of professional communication, that's a very good question. Yeah. We have a question online. Um, so at my understanding, you only use SMS and data call. Do you think your result will change if you consider WhatsApp, Telegram, or other kind of message app? Um, I have no idea. Probably not. There are certain um, papers which are showing that communication is very similar during different platforms. So I assume that these uh, patterns are not platform dependent. Uh, of course, the um, SMSing is not the same type of communications as it was 15 years ago, right? So because 15 years ago, there was no WhatsApp. Maybe these communication channels replaced somewhat, um, for example, short messages, but I would expect that um, the patterns are rigid or actually consistent overall communication channels. Okay, I want to, I want to thank both speakers for keeping the uh, session perfectly in time. And I think we can thank them for their presentation and just uh, move to the uh, coffee session. Thanks. Thank you very much.